Hi, this is Misha, and today, in kind of our ongoing revisiting of some of the, the older guns, we're going to look at Swiss military service sidearms from the late 19th century through uh, more or less present day. And this will probably end up being a two-parter, but we'll get started. Here we have an 1892 Schmidt revolver. This one's kind of interesting for being one of the very first truly domestic handguns to come out of Switzerland. We have its successor. This is the model 1929 Schmidt. Then we have the model 1906 Luger. This one was made by DWM in Germany for Switzerland. There are also versions of this made in Switzerland by Bern. And then its successor, in a sense, the model 1929 Luger. These were all made in Switzerland. And many have considered the 1929 to be the best combat Luger. And here we have the most famous Swiss gun. This is the SIG P210 or P49. Kind of started a whole family in a sense. And then we'll wrap up eventually with the SIG Sauer 220 or the P75, which is in a lot of places still current issue in Switzerland to this day. And it definitely started a family. So, the Schmidt Revolver. This was the same Rudolf Schmidt that designed the famous straight pull bolt action, the 1889, which led through all the guns, like the 1911 is based on his action, although heavily modified. And the K31, while different, is still inspired by it. We have a video on those rifles, so check that out if interested. But this is his revolver, and I, honestly, it, it predates, as, as you can tell by the model name, 1892, excuse me, 1882, this is when this was adopted. Previously, he had worked on some French designs in Swissland, really up to this point, all of Switzerland's sidearms for the military were foreign designs or foreign manufacturer, even if made in Switzerland. You know, to some extent, this was one of the first truly domestic guns, although, of course, it's a revolver, so it's inspired by several others, including uh, French. It is a double action, single action, six shot cylinder, loading gate with the built-in rod here, twist down. You can do this, which is kind of neat, to load it. This is one of the later styles for using a loading gate, but it's still just a loading gate. That locks back in. We have a hex hexagonal barrel, very late 19th centuries of them. In a lot of ways, a very standard revolver. It fired the 7.5 millimeter ordnance cartridge, so 30 caliber essentially. Very typical. There's not really anything horrible or great to say about it. It was a cartridge. Lightweight, relatively light recoiling, quite accurate, but not especially powerful, of course. This would be the same cartridge that was used in the Swedish 1887 Nagant revolver. And a lot of people think this revolver was inspired by the Nagant. Uh, not really. Uh, this was its own design, and it, mechanically the lock work is quite different. These were going to production in the 1880s. Obviously, in that, at that time, they were firing black powder. Later, they would upgrade the cartridge to smokeless. The first ones would have hard rubber grips. Later, they would go to these wood grips. It's kind of 50-50. They would make about 37,000 of these total, building them well through the early 20th century, really ending production in the 1920s. However, they would stay in service much, much longer. 
and of course many would end up private purchased going on for shooting and other things. Not a lot to say obviously about military service because Switzerland wasn't involved in warfare. They were a good dependable revolver and they were just pretty much a 19th century thing. It's actually quite slim. The barrel's not terribly long. It's pretty lightweight. It feels good in the hand and obviously it has a Swiss quality trigger. It's, a, it's heavy and double action for safety but single it's uh, very nice for a military gun. Nice grade bluing. And that really would remain the standard for a long time in that country. However, Switzerland was interested in self-loading, auto-loading pistols as soon as they started to hit the market. As early as 1897, they played around with a couple of Borchards, C-93 Borchards. But they found it to be lacking, as everyone who really messed with the Borchardt did. It was heavy, cumbersome, not 100% reliable, expensive. It just wasn't fully perfected. But of course, that led to the Luger here. Yogi Luger, who worked with Borchardt, took the design and really perfected it into the Luger toggle system. And really this work began was it kind of entering its final stages by 1898-1899. In the interim, Switzerland would also take a look at another Mauser product, the C96 room handle, but for various reasons did not find it attractive and so didn't really adopt it. Luckily by the time they were done looking at the C96, Luger was ready with his earliest prototypes, so in 1900 he sent them some. This would be the Luger Model 1900. They would officially try it out in 1901 and adopt it as the Model 1900. It fired the 7.65 Parabellum cartridge, 30 caliber. And, you know, it was, um, for an auto loader of that day and time, very good. Maybe not perfect, but better than a lot of its competition around the turn of the century. And as quite as famously known, Switzerland was the first army to adopt for standard issue a self-loading sidearm. So quite unique, gives it a certain place in history. Germany would send Switzerland about 5,000 Model 1900s and then switch over to the upgraded Model 1906, which this is here. This is the German production. The Model 1906 just has a lot of, you know, how to say this, um, obvious upgrades. They went from the dished toggles to these round ones that we're more familiar with. They improved the mainspring. They greatly improved the extractor. Little things like that. Probably the biggest thing you'll notice is the, um, the toggles, though. Something else you'll notice, this has a grip safety. This was offered on the earlier Lugers. In fact, you can find some on the German Navy Lugers. Switzerland went with it. Because of this, we don't have a stock slot. We do have the other manual safety still here, though. We have checkered wood grips, wood-based magazine, holding eight cartridges. We have a video on the Luger, so I'm not going to go too deep into it here, but needless to say, the Swiss Lugers were made to a very high standard. The German ones were pre-war, of course, so had nicely strawed parts. But of course, World War I began, and therefore Switzerland lost its access to these guns. So what they did, they set up a production line at Bern, and they were up and running by the 1920s. And so of the, you know, 33 or so thousand 1906 pattern Lugers, about half remained in Switzerland, half in Germany. Sometimes we call the Swiss made ones the model 1906-24, just to distinguish them. They were obviously every bit as well made. These German and Swiss model guns have extremely nice triggers. They feel very nice. They also have a slightly longer barrel, which is kind of unique. 
we're at about 4.7 inches. So it's kind of unique to being in Switzerland. But of course, these are very expensive. And the Luger uh, claims of how finicky it was in World War I are kind of overstated. It actually performed pretty well. But the fact is, by the 1920s, it, there were several advancements in self-loading pistols. And obviously, this one dates back to the 19th century. So, what happened, since they had a production line in Swiss land, they would discontinue the model 1906 and go to the model 1929 Luger. We still have the same barrel length. We're still firing the same cartridge. We use the same detachable 8-round mag. But we've made some economies. We've gone away from the straw parts to just all blued. We've done away with the checkering on the toggles here. Also on the safety, checkering is gone. And on the take down latch. We've straightened the grip in the front here. There's no longer a hump. We've gone from wood grips to Bakelite. Also Bakelite base to the mag. These could be black, brown, red, anything in between really. Also we've gotten rid of the sling loop. But we have not just simplified it, we've also improved it. This has a thicker frame, thicker slide than the standard Luger. It also has a larger, easier to use, more reliable grip safety. And in general, it's just a little stronger, a little beefier than the 1906. And this is why some say this is kind of the culmination, the best combat Luger. Certainly not the best fit and finish, although it's still very nice. Being made in Switzerland, of course it would be. But it's just, it's made a little more robust. So these would... You know, they wouldn't pull the 1906s out of service, but as people were issued newer guns, this would be what they would have, the 1929. And they would produce about 18,000, give or take, with production lasting through at least 1947, 1948, because this is a very late one here. And these would stay in service along with the other Lugers at least until the 60s. They were still very popular, and of course a lot of people would buy them and take them out. And that's not to say the Schmidt revolver was left behind either. This is the model 1929 Schmidt revolver. And much like with the Luger, this is a, a more cost-effective version, a better mass production. But also it has been strengthened for better durability and reliability. Okay, some changes. We have a round barrel as opposed to hexagonal. We've gone to a simplified ejector here, as you see. Larger checkering on it. Same here. Functions the same, it's just, you know, these parts are all a little thicker and a little less refined, like the hammer's a little thicker back here with larger serrations. The grip is a little redesigned too, it's more squared. We have Bakelite grips, much like with the Luger, these can be black, brown, red, anything in between. Triggers thicker. The lock work inside has been simplified. Basically it's been modernized for the 20th century. They, they went to more modern spring styles and a more modern lock work system. The cylinders you see is a little different. Let's pull this one back up for a second. My hands don't really move that way, do they? It's a little heavier because of the extra metal, but still a good feeling pistol. And I, the trigger on this one is still very nice. We also have a moving firing pin versus just a fixed spike, so it's a smaller pin moving, more modern style. Really none of the parts between these two are interchangeable. They're, they're different. But it's an updated version, much like the Luger. And these would be in kind of secondary production through at least the World War II era, the 40s. And they would serve alongside 
and be a nice supplemental gun. And again, by the 50s, they were being pulled out of frontline service, but, you know, not forgotten. And it really is a separate model because, again, the parts are not completely interchangeable at all with the original. And that pretty much gets us through the World War II period. So you see Switzerland, I mean, they had sidearms. There's, again, not a whole lot to say. Most of these guns that they saw much shooting were in competitions and, of course, just training and practice. But still worth pointing out. And they're really nicely made, and at least until recently, they were all very affordable. In more recent years, the Swiss Lugers have kind of jumped up in price, but for a long time, you could get nice ones for much less than what a German example would go for. And they're just extremely well made. Well, if you enjoyed this video, we'd appreciate it if you click like. Also, if you'd like to talk about your own Swiss guns in the comments, we'd love to talk below. If you'd like to help support us, as always, we'd appreciate it if you click on the link and check out our Patreon page. And also, tune in for part two, where we'll get to more modern guns. This is Misha, and we'll catch you next time.